Hello, uh, Beth Neville here for Art and Life for Milton Access uh, TV. Uh, we have good news today. Uh, the unemployment has gone down to only 13 plus percent. Who could believe that would be good news? And a number of the shops are opening up. Uh, so it's, it's a better day for us and uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to work on the issue of rights, uh, civil rights for all Americans. So turning to a, a, a topic that is a very popular, it's oil painting. Uh, last week we did acrylic. Now oil painting is a much older form of painting than acrylic. Uh, and it, before that, people had learned to paint using egg tempera in a very complex way. Uh, so oil painting was, uh, is a more uh, a technique developed during the Middle Ages using oil. And it's a little more difficult to use because you have to mix oil and turpentine. People used to make their own paints, <clears throat> but we're so fortunate now. All we have to do is go to one of the paint stores and or pick up whatever color we want. And there are hundreds of colors to choose from. So that makes it a very popular uh, media to work in. It's also a very forgiving media, much more so than acrylic. One, it doesn't dry so quickly slow drying. Two, you can mix all kinds of colors together very easily, uh, much more easily than you can with acrylic paint. And three, you can paint over the top. You can do glazing. So, uh, and it gives you four a very rich uh, kind of a, a look. So we're going to look at uh, a painting that I did a number of years ago, and it's pretty much a sample of the kind of uh, attractive qualities that oil painting has. If you look in here and see the brilliant white highlights and the gradations between the uh, rosy orange red and, and the whitish yellow highlights, uh, it, it's very dramatic. And in a lot of respects, it's easier to do that than it is with acrylic paint. Uh, this blending and putting one color. You see here the green is over the top of the orange. That was put on late uh, after there was a little bit of drying. And I love the rich dark contrast of the sap green and the yellow green uh, against the uh, crab apples. This is crab apples from our garden. So all of these characteristics, the richness of the texture, the viv vivacity of the color, uh, the strong contrasts, the ability to go back over and make things very subtle, makes oil painting very attractive. I'm going to take this one down and put up an oil painting uh, on the easel. My husband gave us this easel when we were first married. So that means, right, Robert, this easel is about 55 years old. Yes. And it has served me well. Now I'm struggling, and I say struggling, to paint an oil portrait of my husband, Robert, who is our videographer and has been so helpful. Um, I'm not going to talk about all the problems I'm having with this painting, uh, particularly the, the portrait head or where it's going to go next. It's definitely incomplete. The background needs to be solidified in certain ways. Uh, but the thing that people love about oil painting is to be able to get, say, the shimmer on a robe because you can go over it again and again with fine brushes and get that type of, of shine and subtle transition. This is so hard to do in acrylic. It's practically impossible because by the time you go from here to here, the paint has dried. And then another problem with acrylic is that uh, not only is the paint drying, but when you mix the color uh, and it dries one color, uh, how are we doing here? Am I on the great vision? Okay, great. Thank you for adjusting the camera, Robert. Uh, the, the paint that you mix is a different shade from the paint when it dries. Now, oil painting, that's not true. When you put the oil paint down, it's the same color as it was when you're mixing it. So you don't have this guesswork. Acrylic, oh, I've got that color. No, you don't have the color. It's a slightly different shade. So you get used to that over time, but it is uh, makes acrylic more complex. All right, we're going to shift over and look at some of my supplies. I think you maybe have noticed that I'm in a different studio. 
I'm so fortunate to be able to have two studios and this is the one on the second floor. So we're going to shift the camera now to my paint collection. I'm going to show you how I've set up my paint uh, collection, the tubes. Uh, I'm a big believer in artwork that artwork takes longer than you think. That's my motto. Art takes longer than you think. And one of the things you need to do, uh, I think, as a, if you're really professional, is you've got to speed up the process. You cannot spend time wondering where's the white paint, where's the blue paint. That just is a total waste of time. You can't deal with wasting paint by failing to put the tube tops back on again, having the paint all dried up. So this is my solution. Uh, I made this box uh, with these um, supports inside, diagonal, you know, uh, up-down supports. Uh, it covered the whole thing with wallpaper. Uh, it's looking pretty ratty right now. I did this a number of years ago. And that allows me to prop up the paints so I can see where they are. And uh, the same thing up here. This little tray up here also has a support in the middle uh, for uh, displaying the paints. Now, I'm not super fussy about it, but I certainly want to know where the reds are. Where are the oranges? And this is arranged according to the color. Here's one that's out of place. This orange ought to be over there. Uh, then we get into yellows over here, ochres, uh, all the uh, yellowy ranges. Here's one that needs to be put up here. Yellow ochre belongs there. Uh, then up in here I get to the rosy violets, rosy reds, uh, violets. Uh, then I swing over into all the different browns, burnt sienna, um, ochre, the browns. Uh, this one, amazing, looks like a black. It's Van Dyke brown. Does not have its top. That's not a good thing. Uh, in the second tier up here, we have the greens, all the variety of greens, some very old paints I've had forever. Uh, then we swing into blue greens. This blue green belongs over here. This is a blue that's got a lot of green in it. Uh, and then into the genuine blues. Then over here, blacks and grays. And then up ahead, above, this is amazing. All of these are blues. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I have 18 different shades of blue paint. <laughs> it's really, and you can do that practically with every color. But I find blue to be uh, one of the most uh, perplexing colors. We use it for sky, water, Bob's academic gown, and the painting I just showed you. So that's why now I have a lot of blues. Now, if you do get into oil, the, the thing that's going to go fastest is your white paint. So uh, you always buy white in a, in a one pound tube. Because of the virus, uh, I have not been able to buy a new tube of white. And I have a backup zinc white that I've been hoarding uh, so that I can continue to paint. We also need palette knives. I'll demonstrate those in a minute, what you do with them, very important. Uh, my brush collection. Oil paint is very hard on your brushes. So um, most brushes are not going to last very long. You're continually renewing them. You never have the right brush. I don't care how many brushes you've got. You always wish it were better or newer or a different size or whatever. Uh, it's um, remarkable how... how uh, how problematic brushes are. Then, in order to clean the brushes, I like this stuff the best, silicone brush, a uh, silicone brush cleaning fluid. It's just very cheap, and I just love it. it. The paint just sheds right off. I use a couple of plastic cups uh, to um, you clean the brushes, some uh, paper towels, and then I also have another, I mean, oh yes, this is very, you need a mixing medium. And this one is called Artist Paint, uh, Windsor Newton, a very high quality, uh, extraordinarily expensive, uh, $23 for this little bottle, but worth it. Uh, this is much easier to use, I think, than combining uh, linseed oil and turpentine, which was what we did uh, when I was in college. And you would get a little cups here, and you would put turpentine in one and linseed oil in the other, and it would fasten onto your palette but I haven't used this in years. I'm just sticking with, with this. Another thing I find useful is to have a, 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 a little stick because sometimes these paints will dry out on top. Here's a good example. 
Um, this is a special kind of a brown, um, lead, light red it's called. When you put, if you don't have the top on, this is going to harden up. And if you have a stick like this to jam down in there, a skewer, uh, you can get down to the real tip. You can tell this is still viable paint because when you squeeze it, it's squishy. If it were hard as a rock, you couldn't do it. But this part is all hardened up. Now another trick I found, which works sort of, this is a sort of trick. If you do lose a top, you can take a push pin, there's a push pin, and stick it in there, you know, kind of jam it in. And that will help to prevent that from completely drying out. It's only marginally effective, but it's better than no top. So again, we're going to shift the camera and we're going to do a little bit of demonstrating about what you can do with, um, with oil paint. I hope you're following me all uh, along so far. Main point is don't waste time. That's the big one, all right? And oil painting is fun. All right, we've shifted uh, the focus of the camera and I'm going to uh, show you uh, a little bit about how to mix paint. The first thing you want to do is to protect your clothes. Um, I, I find it very important. Or uh, some artists just always are running around in, in paint clothes. I have stained more clothing that I care about uh, and I find it very aggravating. You can get oil paint out, but in order to get oil paint out of your clothes, you have to work on it right away. You take off the garment you care about, you go down to the laundry, you pour some heavy duty detergent on it, and you take the cloth and you go back and forth, back and forth and that with hot water, not cold water, and you keep doing that until the stain begins to remove, and then you put it in the laundry. So it is possible to get it out if you work on it quickly. If it hardens up, um, if the clothing is always stained. All right, this is my uh, palette that I used. And I was using it uh, yesterday to uh, mix uh, colors, skin colors. I wanted to get uh, some various skin colors. So what I do is I take off this piece of wax paper, trying not to get my hands dirty, and I'm going to throw that in the garbage in a minute. And I found this to be so simple. This is just a stiff board, a little piece of foam core, and I put down a piece of clean paper Actually, it's time for me to have a cleaner sheet of paper. This has gotten pretty blotchy, but it'll be okay. Then using wax paper, I cut a piece of wax paper. This is just a way of saving money. The only way you can save money is good. Uh, when I was teaching art uh, teenagers uh, in the summer, uh, we would do this all the time. You know, we never had a, a real palette. Everybody had their own little piece of foam board. All right, and four pieces of tape on the back. All right, palette, ready to go. Uh, mixing tool is a palette knife, uh, and I chose three brushes in two or three different colors. Another thing that you want to do is you do not want to waste paint. So I'm gonna show you a technique for mixing paints that will help you avoid wasting paint. The first thing you do is supposing I want to mix a pale blue, all right? I'm going to put a little bit of my white paint out, squeezing from the bottom, squeezing it from the bottom so that we don't waste paint in the bottom down here. You can actually coil this out. I get so fussy about saving paint that sometimes I pound it with a hammer until the, all the paint comes out. Now this white paint is getting pretty old. We're down towards the bottom of the tube. So there's a squirt of white paint. Now, if I want to mix a pale blue, uh, I'm going to put the, the blue, we're using blue-gray, Holbein blue-gray, extra fine artist oil, put out by Holbein, good company. You put it on the other side. Uh, again, here's my little push pin. I've lost the top, too bad. Push pin cape uh, helped to keep that together. So, we're going to mix a little bit of the paint. Instead of taking all the blue and mushing it with all the white, we're going to take a little bit of white and a little bit of blue and test it out and see, is that the color we want? Um, yeah, can you move it in a little bit, Robert? Yeah, okay. So, if it's not the color that we want, we can stop and reconfigure, and we haven't wasted all these two colors. Um, so I would say, okay, that's, that's kind of a neat um, blue. 
if, if the paint is stiff, and it seems to be quite stiff, uh, I'm going to take my $23 bottle of painting medium, get a little bit on the palette nut, not too much. If I get too much on there, it's going to get too soupy. I've got too much. I would not paint with that. It's just way too soupy. So you'd have to add more, more white, uh, more blue, uh, until you get a, a good, you want a, 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 a consistency that's got a lot of pigment, a lot of paint in it. And with this, I always put the top on right away. Because if I should spill this uh, over, I've lost $23 worth of material. And I don't want to lose that. Uh, let's mix a little bit of the ochre. Here, fortunately, we still have a functional cap. We put a little bit of that out, put the cap on right away. Helps to keep it organized and, and get you going. All right, supposing we mix a little bit of the ochre, which is a yellowy color, with a little bit of the blue, and it should begin to turn sort of greenish, which indeed it does. All right, supposing we add a little bit of white to that. Let's see if we can get a, a whitish color out of this. Okay, so now we know what the blue and green look like. And we're going to add a little bit of white. And it should turn out to be a beautiful olive green, which it is indeed, a very lovely olive green, paler and paler. Supposing we just mix the white with the yellow over here. That's a gorgeous color. So with just white, uh, a blue, and an ochre, we've managed to create a very beautiful set of colors. Now what are we going to paint on? You can paint on almost anything. These are the pieces of heavy paper that I have covered with gold paint, and I like to do that swishy swishy, you know, go swish, 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 to give that texture back there. I think that's fun. Helen Frankenthaler, uh, an artist that I actually met down in New York City when I was teaching at Fordham, uh, used to paint on raw canvas. So you, I don't, I never followed that, but she became an abstract painter uh, of, uh, of well-known, and she would dilute the paint. She would have it much runnier than this, and I believe she would use large brushes uh, to create her abstract imagery, very romantic. She would hate me for saying that, but I do believe it's true. Uh, very a romantic vision of, of lovely pastel colors uh, and very large canvases that were on raw, raw canvas, unfinished. This is cotton. You can also buy linen. Uh, cotton are the two main uh, materials uh, that, uh, that our oil painters use for backing. Uh, you can buy pre-stretched canvas. This is a cotton pack canvas on wood, uh, made, uh, sold very cheaply at one of the paint stores. We will not say which one. Uh, and this was a portrait that I did that was so bad that I put gesso over the top. <laughs> and you can still see Mary coming through. Can we see Mary? A little bit. I did a very nice portrait of Mary, but this was one that I discarded. Uh, in order to really use this canvas, I would have to um, re-gesso it. It's, it would be unacceptable. But I figured, well, today, let's what, see what, what is happens. Gesso? It's what? What is gesso? Oh, good question. Gesso is a, thank you, Robert. Gesso is a white acrylic media that's thick enough to cover over almost anything. And it, it uh, in order to get, oh, that was an excellent point. If you start with a raw canvas and you want to paint in a more traditional way, you have to gesso the canvas. Uh, and usually it's two or three coats. I've done this for many of my large, very large acrylic paintings. And in between, you sand it down, then you put on another layer of this white acrylic media, let it dry, sand it down, and you, it, it, it fills in the fibers and gives of the cloth and gives you the painting uh, background uh, that you need for traditional oil painting. So, now, this is just going to be a demonstration. I'm not painting anything. It, it, is this tipped enough? Yep. Tip mm -hmm. it up? Okay. So this is what the blue would look like, painted down. And here's my, this is called a filbert, F-I-L-B-E-R-T. It's a brush that has a rounded edge, a very nice type of brush to paint with. So we just dabble on the paint. Now supposing you wanted to blend it, the way I did for Bob's robe. 
you would keep adding more and more blue. Let's get a little more blue out here so I can demonstrate that. That's how I did Bob's robe. Um, keep adding more blue uh, and more blue and more. And if you're really interested in having this be uh, a tapered off, you, I would go back and spend a lot of time going from, from the white and a lot of time touching very lightly, hardly touching the canvas at all uh, with a brush and I can smooth out um, those details and, and go to a, a pure uh, blue paint. So, so basically, this would be so hard to do in acrylic. Oh, I can't tell you, I just, oh. I mean, I love acrylic for certain things, but all right. Now let's take our um, olive green. Isn't that a lovely color? Oh my goodness, what a gorgeous color. Beautiful, all right, and we just kind of brush that on. Now let's put on some of the ochre. That's another gorgeous color, going more toward the ochre. Let's get more of that on. And we can go here. Let's get some pure ochre. All right, we're coming up here to an absolute pure ochre. And if we wanted to, uh, we could go we could go right down to the blue. Let's see if we can make that happen. Oh yeah, because remember we made the olive green. Oh yeah, this is fun. All right, we're going to go, the olive green was made by mixing the blue uh, with uh, the ochre. So we can go all the way from uh, a white here. I'm just gonna take the white right out of the tube. We can have the white up here, all right, go com completely to pure white on that end, and we can go completely to white on the blue end. So what we've got here is we've gone from white through the blues, through the ochres, and we could keep fussing with this all the way to white. So that, that's a wonderful demonstration. I'm, I think that's just, oh my gosh, that's yummy. Wouldn't it be fun to paint with those colors? Hmm, I feel like doing a painting right now. Now I've introduced the ochre down there, which was sort of a mistake, but we won't. So that gives you an idea of how quickly you can go from a white uh, to an ochre. Now we've got a couple of minutes left, and I want to demonstrate palette knife. When I first started painting in college, uh, abstract expressionist was in vogue and we would use palette knife. So you can actually take the palette knife and take the colors and apply it with a palette knife. No brush. This, is, this pet paint has pretty much fallen out of fashion, but in the 19, um, in the, area, the era in which I was in college, um, palette knife paintings were very popular. They were sort of like Impressionism, it was a way to paint in a modern way, but it is, it's, it's fun. You just make little dabs uh, with, with the palette knife, and it gives it a different look, and you can do all kinds of fun things with it. So um, that, that's a fun thing to experiment with. All right, I think this is about time to wind it up. I'm going to show you one more thing where I use both acrylic and oil paintings. I did it yesterday. It is a plea for peace and justice. Yesterday, I wanted to do a poster, uh, a, an encouraging, loving poster to put out in our garden. I do this occasionally when uh, in stressful times for our country. So I decided my motto would be love, as in love your neighbor as yourself, brings peace and justice. I left the and out because I thought it was uh, 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 obvious. Now, this is just a piece of, um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, oh got the name of that board. It's like a pressed, a fake pressed board. And I put the white uh, house paint on as a background. Two coats, took two coats. This is acrylic. So he, these colors, the coloring kind of feeds from the back, which I think is fine. The flowers are acrylic. But then when it came to the hands, is it focused on the hands? Yes. All right. There, I wanted to use oil paint because I wanted to get in the more subtlety of the shape of the hands and the, the coloring. 
And when I finished the two hands, um, it didn't look good without a background. So I said, there's something got to make both those hands pop out. So then I put this blue-green uh, color around the outside to try to make the hands pop out more. So I'm going to do, drill two holes in here, and it's going to go outside. All right. Thank you for watching. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you for watching Art and Life. And next week, it's going to be a really tricky topic. It's called, There's No Cheating in Art. And that's one of my mottos. There's no cheating in art. Along with, it always takes longer than you think. Those are my two uh, main mottos that get me through my art career. Thank you for watching and hope we'll see you next week. Mm -hmm.